So I think uh, today is, is a talk, but uh, we'll, we'll, I'd like to have some dialogue as well. One of the reasons I'm keen to have the opportunity to present to students is to understand this better from the student's point of view. As I say, David has helped me a lot with that in any case, but uh, you may all have different perspectives, and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your, your views as well. But if, if I may, I will ask for some audience participation during the presentation, but uh, if I may, I'll mainly do the presentation first, and then we'll have uh, some general discussion. Is that the right for the room? Yeah. Okay, so as, as Nicholas said, what uh, we're going to talk about is the issue of who should pay for uh, higher education and uh, whether there's a different model which could produce a more sustainable system. Oh, well done. So, uh, so what, what I'm going to do is start off by exploring your attitudes to, uh, to who should pay most tax. So there is an argument that as uh, the highest earners in society mainly provide for themselves and don't provide for the state. So for example, they like to have uh, private health care, they like to sell, send their children to private schools. There is an argument that uh, they should actually pay less tax than uh, those on middle and low incomes. So could I ask you to put up your hand if you believe it's right that high earners should pay less tax than low or middle income earners? Okay, so nobody's put up their hand, but uh, we're all used now to the phenomena of shy conservatives. <laughs> so it's, 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 poss it's possible that uh, you just won't admit it. So can I put the question the other way around, just to check everybody is, is alert and uh, responsive? So could you now put up your hand if you believe it's right that high earners should, if you believe it's wrong that, uh, that it's wrong for low and middle income earners to pay more tax than high earners? Is, is it wrong? Is either wrong or right? <laughs> yes, that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's the next question. So, let's, uh, yeah, so, so it is this right? Uh, is it right to, you could be egalitarians of a sort, and uh, you might think it's right that everybody should pay the same amount of tax regardless of income. So who thinks it's appropriate that everybody should pay the same amount of tax? Okay, so, so we have a few, but uh, they're, they're in, a, in a minority. Um, but uh, if we can go on to the, uh, the next slide. So uh, but it seems that the majority of you are progressives. And so just to confirm that, uh, can I ask you to put your hand up if you, if you think it's right that high earners should pay more tax than those on middling and low incomes? Right. So, so we, have a, we have a majority view on that, and uh, that, that is the conventional view, and uh, I, I, I'm an economist, and uh, from an economics point of view, it must be the right view, because quite simply, the high earners have more money, so they will be the easiest source of tax revenue. You put morality to one side, it's just a reality, they put the money, you need tax, that's the place to get it. So, uh, so now I just uh, wonder if I can ask you a more personal question. Who of you decided to go to university despite the fact that you thought it would make it harder to get a good job on, on their graduation? Maybe, of course. So while well, you may have had many reasons for attending university, you did at least think it was likely to improve your job prospects. That was one of the motivations. And in that you are absolutely correct, as you see on the, uh, on the chart. Uh, it's increasingly difficult to get into a high-paying career without a degree. And throughout one's career, if you have a degree, you're, you're likely to earn significantly more as a graduate than if you've not been educated beyond the level. But uh, different perspectives, so we know that uh, getting a good job is a motivation, but if we now look at uh, uncertainty, can I ask uh, how many of you are certain that you will get into a high-paying career, earning, let's say, over £50,000 per annum within five years of graduation. Who's certain that's, uh, that's what the future holds for them? So, so we have two. We have, we have two. So we have some people who are not that confident, but, uh, but a minority. And uh, I think uh, the rest of you are recognising that there is some uncertainty uh, about your future prospects. Obviously, you're, you're at Oxford, you, you stand a better chance of uh, getting good jobs than many other people, but despite that, you are recognising correctly the uncertainty. And, uh, and this, uh, th this chart here is, is illustrating that uh, it's got two, uh, two bars for each subject, so different subjects. You see the, uh, the return to education, so the expected income uh, from, uh, from studying a particular subject varies by subject, but also you see how uh, uh, the, uh, the best and the worst, this is based on the year of graduation. And uh, you see that uh, the, uh, the year of graduation has a huge effect on, uh, on your return, which is your, your income. And this is because uh, uh, if you leave, uh, if you graduate in the middle of a recession, then uh, it affects not just your prospects of getting a job immediately, but it affects your whole career. If you start off with a period of unemployment, it affects your, your, your earnings throughout your whole career. It's a remarkably sustained effect. And, uh, and, and so, 
all, all of you obviously are hopeful that when you graduate you, you won't uh, be in a recession, but the reality is that when you made uh, the application to come to university, you couldn't possibly have known whether, when you left, there would be a recession or not. That would require you to have foresight four years ahead. It's completely impossible. Those who applied uh, to start university in 2004, left in 2000, applied in four, stroke five to eight, left in 2008, arrived in the jobs market in the midst of a very severe recession. Uh, many of them uh, would not have uh, had difficulty getting, getting good jobs. And uh, you can't possibly know that. So you're, you're correct. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. So, um, okay. so just need to introduce some important financial questions. <coughs> so if there's a situation where an individual, a company or a government wants to spend some money, that it doesn't currently have, then it can obtain that funding in just one of two ways. It can either buy borrowed money in the form of a loan, that would be a debt agreement, or it can issue an equity style contract. Um, are you all familiar with equity and debt, or shall I explain it in more detail? Yeah, I'll, I'll explain it a bit more. Is it debt, debt, debt you're probably uh, familiar with. So the key characteristic of a debt is that it represents a fixed obligation that must be paid back, with interest accruing until the debt is repaid. So, uh, so all the risk is with the, the borrower. So you borrow the money, but you've got an obligation to pay it back. The lender, the person who's given you the money, the bank or whoever, uh, knows exactly what they're going to get back and the interest they're going to collect. Uh, they just have a risk if uh, the borrower goes bankrupt, but that, that happens rarely because it's not very attractive for the borrower to go bankrupt. On the other hand, an equity arrangement is a risk-sharing arrangement. Uh, and if the issuer of the equity does well, then both parties gain. If the, if the issuer of the equity does badly, then both parties accept the lower on the return. And that doesn't mean that the, uh, the uh, issuer of the equity has defaulted, and it's agreed at the outset that both will participate in the gains and the losses. So, some of you may have credit cards, which are a form of uh, loan agreement, and you might have, let's say, used a credit card to buy clothing. And here, borrowing is wholly appropriate. Uh, having so you, so you go to a clothing store, the clothing store has set a price for the clothing, um, and uh, you're able to go into the store, try on the clothes, check the price, check the quality, and you're able to make a fully informed decision as to uh, what, whether that, uh, that item of clothing, clothing was worth it to you. So it's appropriate to take on a debt. When buying a house, it's also common to, uh, to borrow money. The buyer is able to assess the need for a house, and whether they need a house, what size house they need, uh, and if it turns out that uh, their income declines or they can't pay the debt, they're able to sell the house. It retains uh, value, uh, it might even have gone up in value, and uh, they're then able to, uh, to liquidate the debt. But when companies float on the stock exchange, they issue what's known as equity. And this is because the future success of a business is unknown. It might do very well, it might be a recession, it would do badly. Um, so they raise their uh, funds on the basis that they'll share the profits and share the losses with their investors. The reason they do this would be very risky to uh, finance a business where the outcome, the uh, success or growth of the business is unknown, uh, wholly with debt. As if there's then a recession, it might be unable to pay its obligations and it would go bust and have a business that wouldn't have an opportunity to uh, still be around when the recovery comes. So with equity finance, if there's a recession, a downturn, some misfortune, the investors accept that they will share in the firm's difficulties and they will not get any dividends. So it's a risk sharing arrangement. So just to summarize, with uh, debt finance, the borrower takes on a fixed obligation. With equity finance, they share the risk with the buyer of the funds. Does that, does that make sense? Quite an important concept. We've got the finance. Yeah. So uh, equity versus debt, risk sharing versus fixed obligation. So uh, you can now consider the current student loan scheme that uh, some of you uh, may be subject to. Um, on the face of it, it appears you've got a fixed obligation to pay back uh, £9,000 a year, plus uh, whatever you take out for maintenance for each year of study. Uh, but, if, but in fact, it's not a fixed obligation. If uh, you're unfortunate and your earnings are very low, then uh, after 30 years, the debt is written off. You don't go bankrupt, they don't come chasing after you. If you don't do well, you just uh, just written off after 30 years. And even if you are earning enough to, uh, to pay back some or all of the loan, the payments are not uh, based on the, uh, the debt and the interest, they're based on your income. They're proportionate to your income, so they're risk sharing. Uh, the, um, the amount you pay is a, is, a, is a function of how well you do. So despite it being described as a loan, from a financial point of view, 
The loan scheme in effect is in effect an equity arrangement, a risk sharing arrangement. And in this, it's just like income tax. The income tax also works on a risk sharing principle. The better you do, the more, the more you pay. The less, you, the less uh, work you do, the less you pay. And in fact, during the election campaign, uh, David Willits, who was architect of the present student loan scheme, admitted that it was in fact a graduate tax, albeit a tax for the maximum liabilities capped. And it's this cap that has the all effect which we see in the, uh, the graph. Low owners have a cap liability, so uh, we see that, uh, that the low owners have got the total amount that they'll repay there, and uh, if you only own £21,000, you don't ever repay anything. If you earn from £4,000, you might pay £10,000 back, not, not the full amount of the loan. So, so the uh, low owners have a cap liability, and uh, the, uh, the high owners have a cap liability based on the uh, notion on that, the three times £27,000, or I put in here £36,000 to take account of some uh, maintenance. And the net effect of having these caps is that it's the middle income earners who uh, pay most and for longest. So given that Mr. Willett's accepted that the loan scheme is in fact a tax, it's, it's kind of odd that it's progressive from low to middle incomes, but then regressive from middle to high incomes. Regressive meaning that uh, the, uh, the proportion of income paid actually declines the more you earn. So, Despite, despite that criticism, thinking back to the type of situation where an equity is more appropriate than debt, so we had buying clothes and house on the one hand and financing companies on another, we can see that financing higher education through equity is appropriate because of the uncertain nature of a student's future prospects, which the majority of you recognise. So a legitimate question is, turning to um, how Nicholas introduced the presentation, if the student loan scheme is in fact a graduate tax, Given the public benefit that accrues from higher education, why don't we just roll the cost of higher education into the general tax take and make the university degree appear free at the point of entry to all a right, we would say, rather than a, rather than a uh, cost. So there are a number of reasons why this is not a good idea. So what, what we have here is uh, the proportion of the population who are graduates. Currently it's already up to 38%. Uh, the proportion of um, 18 to 24 year olds who are currently in higher education is 45%. So clearly that uh, is going to continue to rise and be half of the population. So we take, we think of the, the public now, and we can of course divide the public into just two groups. There's graduates and non-graduates. Everybody must be either a graduate or a non-graduate. And, uh, and, and so now let's think about these uh, public benefits that we talk about. One of the uh, public benefits is that uh, Societies with high levels of higher education tend to be healthier than uh, those with lower levels. But uh, we also know that uh, between graduates and non-graduates, it's the graduates who are the main beneficiaries of this. Graduates have significantly better health than non-graduates. Another one of the public benefits that is talked about is uh, reduced crime. And, uh, but again, we know that graduates are less likely to go to prison than non-graduates. So again, it's the graduates who are the main beneficiaries of this uh, reduced uh, crime effect probably because their job prospects are better, so they have less uh, inclination to return to crime. And the, 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 the final uh, significant public benefit is uh, better economic growth. Uh, you tend to see better economic growth in societies with more higher education. But most of that again accrues to, uh, to the graduate part of the population, who, um, you noticed it from that, that graph earlier, they earn on average £12,000 per annum, more than non-graduates. So, so what, what, what do you have? You do have public benefit, but most of that public benefit is actually accruing to the graduate part of the public, almost half of the population. And consequently, if you ask the non-graduate public to make a contribution to pay for the higher education system, we're actually asking the poorer part of the population who aren't beneficiaries of the private benefits of higher education and are the very limited beneficiaries of the public uh, benefits of higher education to subsidise the wealthier beneficiaries of both the public and private benefits of higher education. And as we agreed, not everybody, but in general we agreed the principle that high owners should pay more tax than low income earners, having the poor subsidise the rich in this way conflicts with uh, what we all agreed. So one could perhaps argue that current graduates in employment should pay a special tax so that gaining a degree can be free to current students. So the, so at the moment you tax uh, current graduates and you would not uh, have to enter into a student loan agreement. 
But of course, uh, you too, uh, at the point that you graduated, you become subject to this uh, special tax. So, although it might appear to be free up front, you would end up uh, paying through, uh, through this tax subsequently. So, whether students take, take out the present style of student loan to pay for their studies, or whether they pay through the tax system when in employment, there is no doubt that students will have to pay for their education, for the higher education system. And that's as it should be, because they are wealthier than the rest of the public who do not go to university. But even then, why not just have a graduate tax? Uh, for two, two uh, initial reasons. First, a recent study estimated that 10% of high earners, predominantly graduates, emigrate, leave the country. So even with the present scheme, it's actually hard to collect money from those who emigrate. With a tax, there'd be no chance at all. You have no right to levy a tax on, uh, on foreigners. So there's clearly no public benefit to educating those who emigrate, and no reason why those who left in the UK should pay for those who've gone. So graduate tax is unfair and inefficient, just from that point of view. Secondly, there's an accounting rule. Uh, the, government, the way the government does its accounting means that if it pays up front for the universities and only collects the money years later through tax, the deficit is deemed to increase. If, however, it issues what it calls loans that it expects to be repaid, it can keep the whole transaction on its balance sheet and shrink the deficit. It may appear to be a financial artifact, but uh, the times when the bond markets look at uh, the, uh, the magnitude of a country's deficit, it's uh, quite important that uh, the deficit is, the deficit is kept down. Now, some of you may think that I've been defending the, uh, the, the, uh, the student loan scheme. I've said some things in favour of it, but I, I, Emphatically, I do not support it. Uh, but the problem I see is not who pays for it, not who pays for higher education, but who receives the money. And the statistic that most uh, concerns me is that 34% of graduates, that is over a third of graduates, are still in non-graduate level jobs. That's jobs they could have got even if they'd not gone to university, fully five years after they left university. So that means that they're not getting value for money for their education. And despite that, and perhaps this is one, this will be uh, students who left under the previous loan scheme, but we see the trend is upwards. Uh, there's no reason to, uh, to assume that it would, uh, it would decline in the future, and, uh, and some of those graduates in the future will be ones uh, who uh, started under the present loan scheme. They'll have a very substantial liability, um, which uh, for something that was of no value to them, they'll just be working because they could have got an NFS. Now, it is true, of course, that uh, because the uh, current loan scheme, you only pay back in proportion to your income, uh, so while they're on the low income, they, may, they won't have to pay much back. But uh, some of them, at some point, uh, they might find their way onto a higher paying career through their own efforts, totally unrelated to their education, and uh, quite unfairly, they would still have to pay back the, uh, the cost of the uh, education, the £27,000. Uh, even though the education has been of no value to them. So this is where I believe the debate should shift onto different ground. We should be focusing on the value for money and not the quoted cost of a degree. To put it another way, we should drop the pound burning mentality and think like John Lewis. So when we talk about value for money, we do not mean that something needs to be cheap. Here, John Lewis have uh, two toasters for sale at very different prices. But a buyer is confident that both offer good value. That's the John Lewis promise. Just that one offers superior features in exchange for a higher price. There's an analogy in the US higher education market. At one end of the spectrum, you can take a degree uh, largely through uh, MOOCs, uh, online courses, uh, which are very cheap, but uh, the reality is they're not as highly valued by employers. At the other end of the spectrum is a Harvard MBA. It's outrageously expensive, but extraordinarily good extraordinarily good value for money because future incomes are very high in the Harvard MBA. But in the UK, everybody pays much the same. Well, some will get a great job, and one third, as we saw earlier, get no real benefit from the expense they've undertaken. So this is where I see the real problem. A student shouldn't have to mind of paying back a huge sum of money if an education helps them, in, helps them into a very high paying career like the Harvard MBA. But something has gone badly wrong and they still have an obligation, even when their education turned out to have little value. So what we need is a system where there are stronger guarantees that students get a benefit from their education, not just for a year or two, but throughout their working careers. To analyze how to achieve objectives of this kind, an economist will look at the incentives affecting the players in the, uh, in the situation. 
So a student has a fairly strong incentive to try to get a good education that will be useful throughout their career. They'll earn more, they'll have greater job satisfaction, better health, and be less likely to be tempted by crime. The problem for the student, as uh, you all correctly identified, is that it's impossible for them to know what the future holds. So they might make a course choice which appears as due at the time, but which turns out to be valueless at some point in their career. Now let's have a look at the university. They're paid £9,000 per annum per student, regardless of whether or not the course is of value to the student. Their focus is on persuading students to apply and accept places, and then on finding ways to educate those students at the lowest cost compatible with their various regulatory obligations. After the student graduates, they have no interest in the future career plan of the graduate, unless he or she does exceptionally well, in which case they will solicit a donation. So where we determined that the student loan scheme was an equity scheme, with the risk shared between the student and the government, the supplier of the higher education product, the university, does not share in the risk that its product may not give value for money. And consequently, it's unsurprising that we see such a large proportion of graduates getting no value from their education. To correct matters and encourage universities to provide value for money, we should learn something from professional football, where the clubs invest in young players, don't charge them for their training, and share the risk that the training given may turn out to have no value, participate in uh, the, uh, the career that those uh, players will do very well. So in relation to university funding, we simply need to rearrange the student loan scheme so that the repayments go to the university rather than to the government. This is what I call a free market graduate tax. It's like a graduate tax because the amount the graduate pays is proportional to their income, which the present scheme is to a, to a degree. But instead of a state managed system, it takes the state out of the picture and true to free market principles, the supplier of the service has an interest in ensuring that it's delivering, delivering value for money. Because we do away with the anomaly whereby the burden falls most heavily on middle income graduates, the percentage charge could be much lower with this approach, estimated around 5% instead of 9%. And under this scheme, universities would have a much more powerful incentive to ensure that students receive a valuable education and learn skills that would help them in the workplace, because it will participate in the success or the failure of their students. If they don't get jobs, the university won't get paid for the course. Further, because payments take place over many years, say 30 years as at present, the university not only has an interest in the short-term uh, success of its uh, graduates, but actually in the success of its graduates over the whole 30-year period. And uh, consequently, it'd be likely to identify the student who wasn't doing well, who would actually have an economic interest in, uh, in helping that uh, student uh, graduate perhaps through some retraining to, uh, to, to improve their career prospects. So th this principle is actually already being put in place in a small way at two institutions. The London School of Business and Finance doesn't charge fees on one of its programs unless the course results in much higher earnings. While BPP offer a career guarantee with free retraining if the course does not lead to employment. These small examples at least serve to show what might be possible if incentives were aligned correctly throughout the system. So to conclude, students should pay for their education since the majority of the benefits accrue to them. And indeed, under any system, they will pay for their education since they will be the high earners. And we've agreed that high earners should pay most tax, with a few exceptions. So it's not who pays it is the problem, it's who gets the money. Paying student loans to the government removes any incentive on the universities to ensure value for money. The free market graduate tax simply arranges that graduate payments flow to the university, aligning the interests of graduate and university over the long term. So, turn over the questions and uh, hopefully I've uh, answered the questions.